Uh, General Townsend, just want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, I hear you loud and clear, Jeff. You know I have a couple of opening remarks, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we're pleased to be joined today uh, by Lieutenant General Townsend coming to us live from Baghdad. He's the uh, commander of the Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. Sir, we'll turn it over to you for your opening remarks and then take questions from here. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning, everybody, from Baghdad, and happy holidays. Since we're nearing the end of the year, I thought it was appropriate to review the progress the international counter-ISIL coalition has made in our military campaign in 2016. Our partners in Iraq and Syria have achieved a remarkable reversal of fortune since 2014, when ISIL seized large swaths of Syria and Iraq with mass terrorists and long columns of vehicles all flying the black banner of ISIL. It's a different situation in Iraq and Syria today. 2014 was about helping our partners halt ISIL's relentless onslaught. 2015 was marked by helping the government of Iraq and our partners in Syria defend while they organized and built or rebuilt their forces and began to counterattack. In 2016, our campaign is all about the counteroffensive, liberating terrain and the population in Iraq and Syria from the clutches of ISIL's brutal control. ISIL is a tyrannical terrorist group bent on destroying our way of life and imposing their own twisted ideology, plain and simple. They had an early mystique for some, which came from the false notion that they were establishing a state. But ISIL brutalized its own people, and what few services they did provide were financed through the seizure and taxation of peaceful cities and the illicit sale of stolen oil. So besides striking ISIL's military capacity, the coalition has targeted and dismantled their finances as well. We have destroyed every bank and cash reserve we have found. We have conducted hundreds of strikes to destroy ISIL oil infrastructure. We assess these efforts have cost ISIL between four and a half and six and a half million dollars a month. The liberation of key population centers and oil fields have further limited the enemy's access to taxes and oil revenue. We've degraded ISIL's military capacity by killing or seriously wounding more than 2,500 of them since mid-October. And we have captured or killed 180 ISIL leadership figures and hundreds more lower level commanders. Such strikes disrupt the enemy's ability to plan and conduct operations here or conduct external attacks around the world. ISIL's propaganda is becoming less effective. They named their magazine Dabiq after a town in northern Syria which they said would be the site of an apocalyptic battle with the West. It used to feature articles about a utopian Islamic state. Now the name of their magazine is Ramiya because thanks to Turkey and our Syrian partners, Dabiq is under new management, no longer in ISIL's control. Now Ramiya prints articles on how to best kill Westerners with knives and large trucks. As the capability of ISIL as an organization is reduced, the capabilities and resources of our partners continue to grow. To date, the coalition has trained over 66,000 Iraqi security forces and over 3,000 Syrian partner forces. These forces have taken the fight to the enemy. They have encircled and are assaulting ISIL in Mosul and are marching to liberate Raqqa as we speak. Regarding Mosul, the Iraqi security forces have seen a remarkable turnaround. Just two years ago, they were a defeated and broken army, barely able to stop ISIL at the gates of Baghdad. Today, they're conducting a multiple division combined arms assault on a major city 400 kilometers from their capital. This operation would challenge any army. In Syria, Turkey and their partner forces have made tremendous progress in securing the border, liberating a large number of towns and villages, and they are now driving to eject ISIL from the city of al Bab. In August, our Syrian partner force, the Syrian Democratic Forces, liberated tens of thousands of people from ISIL in the strategically important city of Manbij. Last month, 
they started operations to isolate Raqqa, ISIS's self-proclaimed capital. So far, they have liberated more than 800 square kilometers on their march toward the city. All told, almost 3 million people and more than 44,000 square kilometers of territory have been liberated from ISIL in 2016. The coalition's main effort remains to liberate ISIL's twin capitals of Mosul and Raqqa. The liberation of these cities will largely dismantle ISIL's physical caliphate, which is a necessary step in the group's ultimate demise. We recognize the step, while vital, is not sufficient. There is still a lot of work to be done. It will be important to maintain the focus of our more than 60 nation coalition effort. Our Iraqi and Syrian partners have made tremendous sacrifices to free their land from ISIL. Their efforts to defeat ISIL improve security in all of our nations. We look forward to continued progress in the coming year. In closing, let me say that for more than two years now, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and civilians of the counter-ISIL coalition have supported all of these efforts brilliantly. They have provided training, equipment, intelligence, fire support, and advice from the, from the ministry level in Baghdad all the way down to battalion formations at austere and dangerous forward locations on the dusty battlefields of Iraq and Syria. All Americans, other members of our coalition, and the entire world should be grateful and proud of what their sons and daughters are doing to make our nations and the world safer from this evil scourge. I know I'm grateful and proud to stand in their ranks, especially with the holidays approaching. Thanks. With that, I'll take your questions. Lita, uh, Lita Baldor from the Associated Press. Hi, General. Uh, thanks for doing this. Good to see you again. Um, I have a couple questions on Syria. Um, first, can you uh, say what, if anything, you all are seeing in terms of the evacuations out of Aleppo? Are you seeing any people moving out of Aleppo at all? And does the fact that ISIS has retaken Palmyra complicate anything for you as, um, as you try to rally more the forces for Raqqa? And can you say how many Arab forces have you been able to gather for the fight to go back into Raqqa? Okay, thanks, Rita. Um, so uh, just for the technical folks there, the mic is kind of getting overpowered, and it's really loud and hard to understand what the question is. But I think what I heard, uh, she asked me about Aleppo and uh, the withdrawal from there, the wrapping up of Aleppo, and the complications that causes for our campaign. And then I think hold forces for Raqqa is what I heard. Uh, so I'm going to answer those, and if that's not the right thing, you can ask me again, Rita. Okay, so um, uh, I, I watched the Aleppo on TV. It's horrible, uh, like most of you. And I read intelligence, so I get special access to intelligence about Aleppo, but Aleppo is not in our charter here. Uh, so I'm blessed, although it's a, it's a curse. The complicator is we have a civil war right next to our war. Uh, even overlapping our war here against uh, ISIL or Daesh. Uh, but I'm not responsible for what's going on uh, uh, for the coalition in Aleppo. The coalition's not doing that. So I can't really comment on the withdrawal or the end is near or any of that. You probably know about as much about it as I do. Now, it does complicate our life here. Imagine uh, fighting one war with another war raging just beside and sometimes overlapping uh, our war uh, against ISIL here in northern Syria. So it's certainly a complicator. Uh, then I think you asked a question, I thought I heard something about hold forces for Raqqa. So uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces are marching to isolate Raqqa. Now once they get isolation in position, we'll probably have uh, another uh, a pause for a planning event as to how to go about the seizure and liberation of Raqqa. But one thing we're agreed on is that the hold forces will consist of folks from the local area. 
And that's pretty much been the mode of operation for all of these liberations in Iraq and Syria is ultimately the security gets turned over uh, to folks from the local area and governance is returned to them as well. So we're looking for a force uh, from the Raqqa environs and mostly Arabs because that is the ethnic composition of uh, Raqqa. So that's what I would anticipate uh, the force will look like once we get down there. Several thousand fighters are marching uh, towards Raqqa right now, many of them uh, from Raqqa or the villages and towns on the way to Raqqa. We're going to do handheld here. Okay. Um, General, one of the questions, um, I'm sorry you couldn't hear, uh, was Palmyra and what complications that might be posing with the Islamic State um, taking control of Palmyra again. And I, I was wondering, the number of Arab forces that you've been able to pull together so far and whether you expect that to grow as you get more U.S. forces in based on what the Secretary announced the other day on, with the additional 200. Okay, Rita. Um, that's much clearer, by the way. Uh, whatever you've done to change it, it's better. Uh, so. Um, uh, Palmyra. Uh, yeah, so um, ISIL has launched a counterattack there uh, and taken Palmyra in the last couple of days. Uh, the Russians and the Syrian regime uh, took it from ISIL some months ago. Uh, um, ISIL has retaken it from them. Personally, I think uh, they were probably took their eye off the ball in Palmyra. Uh, because they were so focused on Aleppo um, and they didn't uh, properly secure their gains. So ISIL has been looking around the battlefield trying to get some sort of victory to reverse uh, the loss of his uh, narrative across Iraq and Syria. Um, they tried a few spoiling attacks in Iraq and uh, Syria against the coalition forces and our partners. Uh, they've been unsuccessful. Um, so the, I think they saw a weak spot at uh, Palmyra against the Russians and the regime, and uh, they've had a, a little bit of a victory there. I, I expect that the Russians and the regime will address it here in short order. We're, we're, it's complicating our life a little bit uh, because the uh, ISILs managed to get their hands on some equipment there. Uh, we're watching that, and uh, as soon as we have an opportunity, if the Russians and the regime strike it, we will. Next, we're going to Phil Stewart from Reuters. Hi, General. Just to follow up on Le uh -oh. Sorry, we missed that last bit. You just, uh, if you want to, if you could repeat yourself. I've stopped. Sorry about that. Um, so just to follow up on, on Lita's question, um, it, you know, you said, you mentioned the equipment that was seized. Um, could you give us a sense, are there any man pads, are there any equipment that was seized that could threaten U.S. aircraft or U.S. operations? And then on the, on the uh, broader issue of Aleppo, you know, there is concern that, uh, a vict uh, that they, the defeat of the, this kind of opposition could wind up being good news for, for Nusra, uh, good news for, for ISIL. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is, it gonna make, is this going to make your, your Nusra and ISIL problem uh, worse in Syria? Thanks. Okay. Uh, your first question, I think, was about uh, equipment seized at Palmyra by ISIL. So uh, I'm not really exactly sure. I, we, they didn't send us an inventory of what they've uh, seized there. We believe that it includes some armored vehicles and various guns and other heavy weapons, possibly uh, some air defense equipment. Uh, basically, anything they seize poses a threat to the coalition. Uh, but we can manage those threats, and we will. Um, I, I anticipate that uh, we'll, we'll have opportunities to strike uh, uh, those, th that equipment and kill the ISIL that's operating it soon. Um, then uh, your question about Aleppo and will that, you know, will that free up forces that will further complicate their, my life. Um, it's really hard to make uh, what we're doing here in Syria any harder than it already is. Uh, probably the conclusion of Aleppo 
whatever, however it concludes, is I would anticipate will be a bit of a complicator for us, but I don't know exactly how. Uh, I think most of the actors there in Aleppo probably have other ideas what they're going to do next. Uh, but we're certainly uh, looking out for that. Thanks. Okay, next we'll go to Tara Kopp with Stars and Stripes. Hi, General. Thank you for doing this. Um, another one on Palmyra. Uh, you just said that if the Russians don't strike it soon, we will. Is there any sort of coordination going on, particularly with the threat of any captured equipment that the U.S. would act on Palmyra? And then I have one follow-up. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, so uh, we don't coordinate our activities as, mu as much as deconflict them with the Russians. And uh, so Palmyra is their part of the battle space. Uh, but because uh, ISIL may have come into the possession of some significant pieces of weaponry there, we're concerned about it. And uh, I think Russia will probably uh, take action um, if they don't. We will do what we need to do to defend ourselves, and we'll coordinate. We'll deconflict those actions with the Russians. Um, I think maybe, probably, we will strike it if we see it moving away from uh, Palmyra. I think if it stays, as long as it stays at Palmyra, the Russians will have a uh, lead, uh, and the regime will have the lead to deal with that. I think that answers your question. You said you had a follow-up. It does. Thank you. Um, and then in your introduction, you said that uh, U.S. trainers and advisors had trained a force of 3,000 Syrians. And I just wanted to know if you could break that down for us, um, who makes up that 3,000. And it seems to be a slightly different number than we had heard in the past of forces of like 5,000. Um, so maybe if you could just clarify that a little for us. Okay. Um, well, I can't uh, speak to what number you've heard in the past, but um, so that number breaks down, and I'm not going to get into uh, details, but it breaks down into two groups. Uh, what we refer to as vetted Syrian opposition. Those fighters uh, have largely operated over there uh, south of the Turk border, um, down through Dabiq, uh, and uh, they have helped the coalition and to include Turkey in um, liberating large areas of uh, northern Syria there that I referred to in my opening statement. The other group uh, that we've trained is the Syrian Arab uh, Coalition, which is a Arab component of the Syrian Democratic Forces. And uh, we've trained both of those. They're, they're distinctly different forces. We've trained both of them. I'm sorry, you had a follow-up, Tara? Thank you so much. Um, just one last one. Uh, with the announcement that uh, 200 additional trainers would be headed to Syria, could you give us a rough estimate of how many trainers are there now? And uh, uh, Lita had asked about this, but will their primary job be to um, add to that 3,000 number to, to grow that force? Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to give you specific uh, troop numbers uh, out there, coalition troop numbers on the battlefield, because that's just information that the, the enemy's probably watching this press conference, and I don't want him to know. Uh, so uh, there are several hundred out there, and we're going to add a couple of hundred more. Um, and yeah, they're not just trainers, but uh, they're also supporters. Of, of trainers, and uh, they're also advise and assist teams. They run the whole gamut of what we're adding there. And yes, you can certainly bet that they will add to the uh, number of um, Syrian partner forces that we will train as a primary task for those additional troops. Next, we'll go to Joe Tabbitt with Al Hura. Thank you, sir. Uh, I want to I want to go back to Aleppo. Uh, what do you expect after the fall of, of Aleppo? Is it, is it fair to, to say uh, that Assad is winning right now? I would ha also have a follow-up.
Okay. Um, so for all of you in the room, again, my charter is not uh, the fighting Aleppo or the Assad regime. Uh, so my opinions probably are maybe not that much better informed on it than you are. Clearly, I'm watching it, uh, but again, I'm not, I'm not one to cast judgments on it. I would say this. Uh, when, when Aleppo wraps up one way or the other, those forces are going to go elsewhere and do something else. The opposition forces uh, and the regime uh, forces and their Russian supporters. Uh, our estimate is they'll probably go uh, somewhere else that is uh, more important to them. Uh, and I won't care to comment on where we think that might be. I understand, sir, that... Uh, I, I do understand that Aleppo is not part of uh, your mission in Syria, but you cannot ignore that uh, the fall of Aleppo into the hands of the Syrian regime would have implications uh, in regards to Turkey and also in regards to the rest of the country. Uh, uh, what 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 are the implications that this the fall of the city could have on Turkey? And you mentioned in your opening statement that Turkey is liberating many areas in northern Syria and is heading towards Al Bab. Don't you see any implications of the from after the fall of Aleppo on Turkey? Um, yeah, I'm sure there are some implications uh, on the regime for the regime. There's implications for um, the Russians. There's implications for the opposition, and there are implications for Turkey. I guess what I'm trying to communicate to you is uh, that uh, we don't see that those implications are going to significantly impact our campaign that we're doing. Because I think the regime and the opposition forces uh, that are fighting their war adjacent to ours uh, will take their fight elsewhere. And again, uh, we think that the impacts on our campaign will be relatively moderate. Barbara Starr with CNN. Uh, thank you, General Townsend. Can we go back to uh, some of the comments you made about the progress you're making against ISIS, and can I ask you to unpack that a little bit? Uh, specifically, yesterday the White House, Brett McGurk said there were 12 to 15,000 ISIS-capable fighters left, the lowest level ever. So can I ask you to kind of walk us through some of where you have come from and the level of progress you made? If there's 12 to 15,000 left, that's against what peak ISIS warfighting force the U.S. coalition was facing, and what kind of capability do you actually think ISIS has right now on the battlefield? Okay, uh, Barb, uh, thanks. Yeah, so I think uh, Brett McGurk's um, estimate of 12 to 15,000 fighters is ballpark close enough. Uh, we don't uh, track that in painstaking detail because it's kind of hard to define fighters. So you're talking about committed fighters who will die in place, or are we talking about um, people who are going to start waving a Syrian or a Iraqi flag as soon as the coalition starts approaching. So there's fighters all along that spectrum and supporters. But I think uh, 12 to if we got to have we got to have a number so 12 to 15,000 is probably good enough. Uh, I don't actually know what the number was. I've heard uh, the the uh, peak number. I'm not sure what it was. I've heard figures 30,000, 50,000. I don't know what the peak number was. Uh, and um, again, it's kind of hard to define that because I'm not sure, and people who throw, sure that people who throw those numbers around are defining them in the same way. I'm not really sure it's all that important what the number was at its peak for us to know that. Suffice it to say this: um, 
we've taken back over half of the land that um, Iraq, for example, lost to ISIL in 2014. Um, so I think that's a measure of the progress. And I could sit here and list city after city, uh, Ramadi, Fallujah, Rupa, Tikrit, Beji, Sharkat, Kiara, and now we're at the gates, banging down the gates of Mosul. So that's an example of uh, the progress that the, our Iraqi partners have made. Uh, what's ISIL still capable of doing? They're still capable of uh, fiercely defending the ground they have taken. We're watching that unfold every day. They're not making anything easy. They're, they're fighting hard uh, to retain the vestiges of their physical caliphate, and I don't think that's going to get any easier. Um, they're also capable of launching dangerous attacks in, in Iraq and Syria and in this region. As we have seen recently in Palmyra, you were asking your colleagues there were asking me about Palmyra. We also know that they are plotting attacks uh, on the west. And we know that uh, central to external operations uh, plotting is the city of Raqqa. And that's why we need to get down there and isolate that city as fast as we can. Just in the last week, uh, we conducted a strike, our special operating forces conducted a strike in Raqqa that killed uh, three uh, plotters. Two of those plotters had direct links to the November 2015 attacks in Paris. So that kind of plotting is going on in, in Raqqa and they still have the ability uh, to uh, motivate uh, self-radicalized followers and they still have the ability to plot and cast into motion uh, attacks on the West, and that's a great concern to us, and we are hammering away at them to uh, prevent that, and we're going to get down to Raqqa and get it isolated and, and then seize it uh, so they can't plot from there in the future. Next, we'll go to uh, Cassie Maleri of the Anadolu News Agency. Hi, General. Thanks for doing this. I will have a couple of questions. It was widely reported in the region that several U.S. helicopters landed in YPG-held Ain al-Arab recently to deliver ammunition and equipment to the group. And uh, social media accounts close to the group also confirm uh, those claims. Could you comment on that? Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with the reports you're referring to. I'll just tell you this. It's uh, not U.S. policy uh, to provide uh, weapons by helicopter or any other means uh, to the YPG. Uh, we do uh, provide equipment, including weapons, and training to the Syrian Arab Corps or Syrian Arab Coalition, which is a part of the Syrian Democratic Forces. About Palmyra, you said uh, as the Assad regime and Russians were so focused on Aleppo, they've left a vacuum behind which led ISIS to take over Palmyra. Do you think that they are further focused on the opposition-held areas which led to the regime to lose more territory to ISIS? Um... Hmm. I'm not sure I followed your question. I know it had to do with Palmyra, and I'll just kind of restate what I said earlier. Uh, my, my own assessment is that, uh, you know, the, clearly the regime and with Russian support uh, were very successful in taking Palmyra back some months ago. Se it seems like I remember they brought in an orchestra from uh, Moscow or somewhere in Russia to perform a concert there in the ruins of uh, Palmyra. Uh, to celebrate their victory. I think that uh, they failed to uh, consolidate their gains and they got distracted by the things they were doing, took their eye off the ball there. The enemy sensed weakness and uh, struck and uh, gained uh, a victory that I think will probably be fleeting, uh, but uh, a victory against the regime and the Russians nonetheless. My question was this. Do you anticipate that the, as the regime and the Syrian R Russians are focused on opposition, in the north, northwestern Syria, they are going to lose more territory to ISIS behind them. Uh, 
Um, I, I suppose it's possible, I, I, but I don't, I don't think it's likely. Uh, I think what they'll do is they'll devote, I think this is probably an embarrassment to them, and I think they'll devote adequate attention to uh, holding the ground that they're on. And I don't think, uh, my guess is they probably won't lose much more terrain to ISIL, and uh, that's my guess. Okay, next we'll go with uh, Tom Bowman from NPR. Uh, General, I want to return to Palmyra. You said that you're basically waiting for the Russians to take on ISIS there, which is unusual because you and your uh, colleagues have said repeatedly that Russia is not going after ISIS. They're going after moderate rebels in the country. So if your job is to basically destroy ISIS, why wouldn't you go after them right now? And also, you mentioned that this is Russia's battle space. That's some, a term we've not heard here yet. Are you basically saying the country is divided, that, that the coalition has its own battle space and Russia and Syria has its own battle space? And also, if I could quickly turn to Raqqa. You say you've trained 3,000 Syrian Arabs. Give us a ballpark of how many you expect to be able to take Raqqa itself. Is it double that number, triple that number, or even more? And also, Turkey has said it wants to be involved in the final assault on Raqqa. Uh, do you still expect that to happen? There was talk that the uh, Turks wanted their, <laughs> I'm almost done, that the Turks wanted their own trained rebels to take part in the final assault on Raqqa. If you could address that, that's all. <laughs> Okay, Tom, uh, I don't know if you have any follow-ups. I think there were about, I lost track. I had four questions, I think, in rapid fire succession there. So uh, I'll try to remember what, I started writing them down, then I'll try to remember what they all were. You were providing them pretty quick there. So, uh, Palmyra, uh, right. So there, there, there's not necessarily a battle space. We don't have an agreement with a map, with a boundary. The Russians have this, and the coalition has that. There's not such a thing. Uh, there are facts of life. There are places where the regime are, and there are places where the Russians are with the regime, usually, and there are places where the coalition and our partners are. These are facts of life. It's not an agreement. It's not a division of labor or the country or anything like that. It's just where people are. So at Palmyra, uh, it's not Russian battle space. I think I, I use that phrase kind of fairly loosely, but they were there. It was theirs. They were there uh, with their... Uh, Syrian proxies. Uh, so um, yes, they lost it, and um, it, so I think it's up to them uh, probably to take it back. And the reason we're not acting more aggressively is, first of all, that's the first fact of life is that was theirs. Uh, the second fact of life is uh, we're not sure, sure who is there on the ground. We can't tell one side from the other. So we can't tell if the, the truck and the armored vehicle is being operated by a regime trooper, a Russian trooper, or an ISIL fighter. We can't tell that. So we're just kind of staying out of it and watching it right now and protecting our own interest and letting the Russians sort that out, which I think is probably the common sense way to go about uh, Palmyra. Um, then you asked me some other questions, I think, uh, yeah, preparing forces for Raqqa. Now, I'm not going to quote specific troop numbers, but uh, I'll just say, yes, probably double or triple the number of uh, forces uh, that we've already trained will need to be trained for Raqqa. It's a big problem. Uh, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces have not uh, faced a challenge this great before. Uh, they have... Um, pretty high morale. Uh, they have a lot of combat capability, but still they're going to need some help uh, preparing for Raqqa. Uh, then, yes, you mentioned uh, Turkey, and Turkey has expressed a desire to participate in the Raqqa operation. Uh, we told them um, a couple of months ago that we need to go to Raqqa now. And they indicated they were not prepared to go right now because of all the other activities that they're doing. Um, and there are some helpful activities, uh, kill and dash. So 
uh, we told them that we're going to march down and isolate Raqqa, and after we isolate Raqqa, we'll check back in with them and see if, they, if there's a way they can be incorporated into the operation before we proceed. So right now we're in the approach march phase to uh, begin the isolation of Raqqa. I hope I got all of your questions there. If you have four or five follow-ups, I'll write faster this time. One quick follow-up. Uh, what role do you expect Turkey to play? Would it be... There's talk of sending their own trained rebels down to Raqqa, or would it be some sort of Turkish aircraft? I mean, it, it would it be a Turkish government thing or their trained rebels? Do you have any sense of what they want to do? Um, now you'll have to ask them. I don't really have a good sense for what they want to do. Um, I think it's probably a combination of the above, sort of like we're doing. Uh, they have their preferred partner force, uh, wh who I'm, I think they'll probably want to have involved, and uh, they may want to participate with their own military, like uh, in a limit to a limited degree. Uh, none of those things have been worked out yet. Carlo Munoz from the Washington Times. Hey, sir, thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, the Mosul operation, um, specifically west of Mosul, where the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, PMUs are operating. Um, I understand that uh, some Iraqi troops had been embedded with those forces as they're moving towards uh, Mosul. One, can you give me a ballpark idea of how many Iraqi troops are with the militias? And two, how is the coalition sort of threading the needle and providing support, whether it be air support, logistical support, any kind of support to uh, the Iraqi troops with while still maintaining the fact that there is no support provided to the uh, militias. Okay. Um, so your question is about the PMUs you mentioned. We call them PMF. Um, so the PMF are operating west of Mosul. In fact, that they've been remarkably uh, disciplined in their operations. Um, there has been very little reporting of uh, inappropriate behaviors or actions uh, that, that characterized some of their operations last year and earlier this year and other campaigns. Uh, they've been uh, operating under the government, uh, the control of the government of Iraq, and they've been supporting the uh, Iraq's campaign plan for Mosul. Uh, so they have uh, done a good job of uh, liberating a large swath of desert uh, west, uh, southwest and west of Mosul. Uh, they have severed ISIL's line of communication uh, from Mosul to the Iraqi border and beyond to Syria. Uh, they have linked up with the Kurdish Peshmerga um, north of Talafar. And they have seized Talafar Airport uh, and are in the process of isolating Talafar City. All of these are really good contributions to the campaign. There are uh, at least two army brigades. There are some other formations with them, but there are two army brigades with them. Uh, we haven't provided them a lot of support. Uh, they haven't asked us for a lot of support. Uh, they've been handling things out there largely on their own. Uh, we've conducted uh, various strikes out there. Um, uh, I don't require a lot of justification for doing that. There's ISIL out there that needs killing, so we're killing them. Uh, and it assists the Iraqi security forces and the PMF out there uh, in their work. Fine, good, excellent. But uh, we're not providing direct support to the PMF out there uh, at present. A quick follow-up um, regarding... Turkish trained uh, militias um, out near Bashika. Uh, I wanted to, I understand that they're sort of operating around um, Mosul Dam and in that, that sort of part of this, or outside of the city. Have you been tracking their movements at all? Have, has there been any sort of indications that they move, plan to move closer to the city? Um, um, I heard you. Uh, I heard uh, the part about tracking movements and something about Bashika, but I didn't hear your first few words. So uh, who, were, who were you referring to? 
Uh, sir, I was referring to the uh, militias that are being trained by Turkish troops up near Bashika. From what I understand, they're now operating near Mosul Dam and in that area. Have you been tracking that at all? And is that posing any concern to your, uh, your plans? Um, so, yes, okay, thanks. Uh, Turkish trained uh, militias. So, uh, the Turks have trained some Sunni um, uh, f uh, groups from the Mosul area. Uh, they've done a reasonably good job of training them. They're at their camp at Bashika. Uh, we are tracking their movements. In fact, uh, when they graduated, they left uh, Turkish control and started working for. Uh, the government of Iraq, and they're part of what we call tribal hold forces, uh, a, a variation of the PMF, if you will, local folks who have been trained to secure their local area. So uh, some of these uh, folks that have been trained by the Turks are operating around Mosul, uh, not at the dam. Uh, they are operating north of, on the north side of Mosul in between the dam and, and the city. No, but they're operating under government of Iraq control. Uh, I don't track their uh, movements uh, day by day minutely because they're under Iraqi control. And uh, by all reports, uh, they've done a pretty good job. Okay, next we'll go. I'm sorry, Lori. Milroy. Milroy of Kurdistan Today. Kurdistan 24. 24, that's it. Sorry. Th thank you, General, for your briefing. I wondered, could you... Explain to us about Mosul. It seems to be going, it's, you said it's challenging, but it also seems to be very slow. And comparisons made to uh, Beji or Kobani suggest it would not be before the spring that um, Mosul would be retaken. Um. Okay, I, I, you were a little bit garbled, and I didn't quite uh, catch all of that. Uh, but I think you're asking about the speed of the Mosul operation. I think that's what I got the gist of. So I'll answer that, and if it's not right, you can, you can ask me again. Uh, so um, we're not on a timetable uh, for Mosul. Um, we're, uh, the, uh, the attack started on time. It's progressing. Uh, it's probably not progressing as fast as I, as a U.S. Army officer, would like, but it is progressing, and the Iraqis are advancing every day. Uh, so um, the Iraqis actually would like it to go faster, and they're engaged in discussions and plans about how to inject uh, new energy into their assault, but the facts are they're gaining ground every day at Mosul. And um, how long it will take, I don't know. It could, it could be over. Uh, it could be over in a month or two. It could be over uh, next spring, like you said. Uh, not really on a time schedule, so we're just going to let it go at the pace it's on the Iraqis' pace. Uh, they're the ones doing the fighting and the dying, and so I think that's appropriate. We're here to support them, and it'll go as fast or as long as they want it to. Defense Carter was in Erbil over the weekend and met with President Barzani. Presumably they talked about Mosul, and could you give us any other details on what those discussions involved? Nope. I was in the meeting, and uh, those discussions were between uh, President Barzani and Secretary Carter, and that's where we'll stay. A question about Raqqa. Um, you, you've said that you know it's urgent for the United States for, for the coalition to move quickly on Raqqa. You didn't have time for the Turks to get their act together. There's a threat from Raqqa. Europol issued a report earlier this month talking about ISIS and a chemical and biological threat. Is that one of your concerns in Raqqa? Um, um, okay, I don't think I said that I, we didn't have time uh, for the Turks to get their act together. I think that's your characterization of what I said. But uh, that said, uh, we're concerned about external ops plotting in Raqqa. 
Um, actually, uh, we believe that the sort of locus of their chem bio program, are we concerned about an ISIL chem bio program? Yes, we are. Uh, they have demonstrated a capability. They've demonstrated a willingness to use it. They have used chemical agents against Iraqi and Kurdish uh, and coalition forces on this battlefield here. Fortunately, uh, not to great effect. Uh, but so they have, they're working on it. They have an active program and they're working to make it better. So are we concerned about it? Yes, we are. We think the locus of that program has been in Mosul. I anticipate that they're probably going to try to move it at some point because uh, they know they're going to lose Mosul uh, sooner or later. Uh, I think, could there be parts of that program in Raqqa? I think, sure, there probably could be. But we think Iraq is more their hub for external operations planning. Uh, and I'd, I'm not sure they're going to move their chemical uh, program there, mainly because they know we're approaching Raqqa as well. So if they're going to move it out of Mosul, they're going to move it somewhere else, uh, probably not to Raqqa, because uh, they know they're going to lose both of those here in the coming months. Carla Babb with Voice of America. Hi, General. Thanks for doing this. Um, my question's on Mosul as well. When uh, we learned yesterday that about 15 to 20 percent of Mosul has been kind of uh, cleared by Iraqi forces, do you see that as kind of the timetable progressing? And is there a point or, you know, where the fulcrum will swing, swing to the other side, where things will start going faster if you can go, just get, you know, past the river or just get to 40 percent or 50 percent? Um, okay, yeah, I think probably you're, you're uh, and I think I've used that myself, roughly about 20% of Mosul. I think they're a little beyond that now, probably more like 25% of Mosul, uh, and probably half or more of the eastern side of Mosul, uh, and then you're, has been liberated by Iraqi security forces. It's still a hard, hard fight, and it's a dense urban environment with a 360 degree threat uh, and 3D threat because uh, there's basements and tunnels, uh, tunnels dug to join uh, basements on city blocks and of course you've got uh, several story buildings there of several stories and, and even uh, multiple stories in some parts of the city. So it's a very hard fight, a tough problem. Um, is there a time when I think things could shift dramatically? Yes, I think there is. I think that uh, the, as the Iraqis close on the one remaining bridge uh, over uh, from the E that joins the east side of the city to the west across the Tigris River, uh, I believe that the enemy has, is faced with a very uh, stark choice. Uh, if he wants to fight and die, then he's made that decision, he'll stay there. If he wants to get out to try to fight again another day, if he wants to get out to try to go back home and stop fighting, uh, he's going to have to make that choice uh, soon as the Iraqi security forces approach. So actually, I think you'll see the eastern side will break at some point and go in a rush, and it'll, be, uh, it'll go from really hard like it is today to a whole lot easier, and we won't have to clear every structure block by block all the way to the river because I think uh, a lot of them will get the heck out. Now, that doesn't mean the whole Mosul campaign gets easier. I think, it, actually, the west side is going to be every bit as hard, potentially harder, uh, than the east side. I think uh, he's invested the great majority of his defensive work on the west side. And uh, so I do anticipate there a point, there's a point where it'll get easier on the east side, and then we're going to have to reset the army, secure uh, the gains on the east side, and shift the army's focus uh, to the west side. Do you see that coming soon? <laughs> Y'all are always fascinated with the timetables. No, I don't see it coming soon. It's hard. To uh, Lucas Tomlinson mm -hmm. from Fox News. Hey, General, can you can we go back and can you describe in more detail this air defense equipment that you say that ISIS has their hands on? 
uh, from Palmyra. Can you describe how many missiles, how many launchers, and what type of system it is? No, I can't. I, I didn't say he had uh, uh, air defense equipment. I said he may have air defense equipment, his hands on air defense equipment around Palmyra. Uh, so uh, he may, and uh, I don't care to characterize the size or type or number or any of that. Thanks. And uh, can you describe Al-Bab and why it's so important for Turkey to take Al-Bab? Well, um, so Al-Bab is held by ISIL. So right away, that is a, a reason it's important for someone to take it. Uh, Al-Bab also is the largest uh, sort of municipal area in that region, um, sort of between Aleppo and Raqqa. So there's another important reason uh, to take it. Also, uh, the Turks expressed a desire uh, to uh, create a buffer zone uh, to push ISIL out of a buffer zone away from their border. Um, they've aspired to do that uh, initially out to 20 kilometers. They later said out to about 40 kilometers. Uh, Al-Bab is sort of in between that. I don't think they'll go much farther south because you actually start running into regime elements just a few kilometers south of Al-Bab. So I think they believe that Al-Bab is about as far as south as they can extend their border buffer zone to keep um, ISIL away from their border. Thank you. And lastly, are you concerned that uh, Turkey's they want al-Bab because they also want to divide uh, two separate Kurdish regions, and could that be a, a concern uh, with the campaign going forward? Um, I do believe that's one of the Turks' reasons uh, for going as deep as uh, al-Bab as they desire to keep uh, Kurdish groups separated, uh, those to the east of Al-Bab in the Manbij area, and then those to the west in, in the Afrin area. I think they see it as in their interest to keep those groups apart. Um, I, I don't uh, see that as a, a great concern uh, for us. Uh, Louis Martinez with ABC News. Hi, sir. Thank you again for doing this briefing. Um, quick question about your rationale for recommendation or recommending the additional 200 forces for Syria. What effects were you looking for? Uh, why did you think you needed to recommend the additional forces? And then I have another question. Okay. Well, well, it's pretty simple. I kind of alluded to it in an earlier answer. So, Raqqa is the biggest thing that we've undertaken in Syria to date, and the biggest and most complex thing. So we had uh, a certain number of forces that allowed us to um, assist our Syrian partners in liberating Kobani and Hasaka and Shaddadi and Manbij. As you look towards Raqqa, it's uh, farther away. It's a lot larger. It's a lot more complex. And it's ISIL's capital self-proclaimed capital. So we think they're going to defend it uh, in a very strong way. So just looking at that, it sort of becomes apparent that whatever forces we had to do the things that we had done up to that point, we'd probably need some more forces. The Syrian partners also need more forces. And so that's why I said one of the primary tasks of these additional forces will be to train additional Syrian partners. Uh, so uh, their demand for increased forces for uh, Raqqa is matched by our own uh, requirement to provide additional coalition forces to support them. And the other question I had was about U.S. advisors with the Turkish forces or the Turkish trained forces. Um, I believe that, that was, they were no longer paired up with them when they moved on al-Bab. Um, is that still the case? Uh, at what point do you foresee them going back, if at all? Um, 
Uh, so you're right. We're currently not operating uh, with the Turks and uh, their partner forces, uh, and we're not operating around Al Bab with them. Um, that's uh, the, uh, the their penetration into uh, Syria exceeded uh, the depth uh, which our authorities went. Um, so we've stopped supporting that uh, directly. But I can envision a time, potentially, when we might uh, team up with them again. We've done it before, so I can see a time where we might uh, team up with them uh, directly uh, in support of them again in the future. Uh, next, Phil Stewart of Reuters had a follow-up. Hi, General. Sorry, just to clarify. So in the clearing operations in Mosul, you said about uh, half of the east side of the city uh, has been uh, taken. Does that mean that the U.S. forces now can can go in accompanying the their Iraqi counterparts into that uh, more secure part of East Mosul? It, it basically, is it safe to assume now that U.S. forces are coming in and out of East East Mosul with some regularity? Thanks. Um, okay, so I've answered this question in these uh, forums before. Uh, we're not limited on where we can go. So we accompany our partners uh, to a certain level where we have authorities to accompany them. We accompany wherever the partner goes. So if at some point a partner, we were typically paired up with partner commanders and their headquarters, uh, their forward headquarters, their, their battlefield headquarters. So if those battlefield headquarters are outside of Mosul, that's where coalition forces advisors are. If their battlefield headquarters move into Mosul, which at some point it would be logical that they would as we continue to clear Mosul, then uh, coalition force uh, advisors will accompany them there. They will accompany our partners wherever our partners go to fight Daesh. Just to clarify, has that happened? Are U.S. forces now accompanying in, in Mosul? Thank you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go to that level of detail. That's too much information for the enemy. I want the enemy to guess. With that, sir, thank you very much. Uh, we've used up all of your time. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.